Hello everybody, James here, episode 44 of Storytime with Dutch Mantel. The plugs quick for the books, The World According to Dutch, by the Dutchman himself, Tales from a Dirt Road, by the Dutchman himself, both available from Amazon, or if you want them signed, you make your request at Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's at gmail.com. And I've got two books as well, Dwayne, The Rock Johnson, The People's Champion, and Owen Hart, King of Pranks, two books I've written as well, fine, fine biographies, also available on Amazon links uh, under this video and every video and the podcast and everything and also we've got something else for sale we uh, not we the people we need to do a we the people you people mean nothing to me the classic the classic t-shirt for i never asked you this where did you first make this what territory i think that was in a continental i think i'm pretty sure it was continental and I, i wore it in mid south too well, we've got some questions about Continental coming up in this next hour. And if you want to send in a question for a future episode, send it into questionsfordutch at gmail.com. But we're going to go to the first one. And this is from Auntie Howdy, uh, I believe the wife of Uncle Howdy, apparently. What is your opinion <laughs> on AEW referee Aubrey Edwards? She seems to be a polarizing figure, with some enjoying her over the top theatrics and others very much not so. Also, what makes a good referee, in your opinion? And before before you answer, I think we should watch a little video of Aubrey Edwards in action. Bear with me. And we're back recording again. And here's some videos of Aubrey Edwards going for it. <laughs> Sorry, audio uh, listeners. Uh, for the audio listeners, please do tell us what we're seeing. Well, uh, <clears throat> I imagine this is a little bit of a collection of Audrey Aubrey, is it Aubrey? I think it's Aubrey, yeah. Uh, Aubrey Edwards, some of her uh, refereeing poses. <laughs> and a lot of people have complained about her. And you're going to ask me that question in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what a picture. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll, but, skip, we'll skip the dancing bit, but uh, yeah, Aubrey Edwards. Oh, I like her. If I was a booker, and I don't know why Tony Khan hadn't popped on this, I'd make her get into it with a guy or a girl because she'd she she'd get over. She really would. Hmm. And I'd have, I mean, there's a lot of ways to do it, but I think I'd have her do it with a guy like a like a just an underneath, you know, you know like that they call jobbers, which hmm. That's really a disrespectful term for what they do. They're they are enhancement talent to help guys get over. But I'd have one of those guys, the enhancement talents, get mad at her one day and have her him slap her. And she slaps him back and they got to pull her off him. But of course, they've been through it t- uh, about three or four times before this. And you could build it up for a pay per view. And she'd get over with it. Don't got to go long, but she has the type of personality and looks. Plus, there's a lot been made of her, her antics just off, you know, just off the internet in general. So the people that watch AEW, they know this girl. Hmm. So, and I think there's a, a lot of upside to her, uh, even beyond being uh, a referee. Now she may not she may not want to wrestle. That might be uh the part. But what she's got to do, what I would have planned for her to do is not wrestle. You would actually work to her skill set, which is punching and stomping mm-hmm. around and her getting mad. And but I think it would work, but I but I like her. I don't care what anybody says says about her. They said, Oh, she takes away from the wrestlers. Believe me. Sometimes you want to take away from some of those <laughs> AEW, AEW wrestlers and concentrate uh, on the referee. To me, I actually like her a lot. What? Whoops, Sugar Ray. I've done the wrong camera. There we go. I'm back. Um, what makes a good referee? Oh, well, a good referee is uh, <clears throat> stays out of the way. He's always he's not in the way. Works the corners. And a, a good referee is right on top of you. I just explain works I, the corners, works the corners. Uh, what, what does that mean? 
stays out of the way. Oh, just basically just stays in the opposite corner. Yeah, he's 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 not. If you're in the middle of the ring, he's in a corner. He's not right up there on you. So you couldn't hit him if you wanted to. But and then he's he's in there when he's when he needs to be, and he's out when he needs to be. And that's an art form too. Some guys can do it. Some guys can't. And the the people that talk about Aubrey Aubrey Edwards that she takes too much of the of the attention off the wrestlers, I don't think so. I, they they've been male wrestlers doing that. And now, if it was a male wrestler doing it, I I could maybe join in. He he is taking it off, but I don't th- I don't think she's doing it. I think she actually. She actually helps a lot of matches. Who's Can the best you hear ref- that? Uh, I, did, hear that? Uh, I did hear some table scraping or something, yeah. Well, that's not it. But it was a, I got my door open here because I'm in Florida. And that road, I can see it from here, but barely because i got to go through trees. It's very loud out there sometimes. Mm. So I was wondering if you could hear it. So uh, what were you saying now? Uh, who's the best, best referee of all time? Hmm. Well, uh, I will say the Hebner brothers, both of them. I worked a match one time. We were in, I forgot where it was, Philadelphia somewhere, I think, maybe. It could have been, I don't know. But we was at this huge National Guard armory. And some guys were late getting there, and they told me, listen, you got to go out here and you got to stretch this match with Joel Deaton, who was, he, he was under the hood. I forgot what his name was then. You got to go to, we tell you to end it, which could have been over an hour. I said, what? Yeah. Because those other guys aren't here and we're waiting for them to get here. I go out with this Joel Deaton and he's a good worker. And we have decent match for 25, 30 minutes. But by this time, it's getting a little bit tiresome. Then one of the Hebners, it was Earl. I said, Earl, now we got to start having our match. What do you mean? I said, well, just listen to me. And so then me and Earl got into it. He was in my face and I was in his face and, so finally, when they said to go home, I said, well, I got to finish. I threw him outside and I told him the to sunset flipped me over the top. <laughs> and But I had the rope, right? And I'm hanging on, hanging on. I mean, he had already sunset, but I was hanging on. And I wouldn't break. Wouldn't, and Earl stepped back, kicked my hands. One, two, three. People popped. And it was a great finish for that type of match. Then me and Earl got into it again. I shoved him, and then he shoved me, and I took a bump, and, he, and then he pulled his shirt off. And, but now the people think they're going to get something, but I left. But those two guys, uh, Earl and what was the other's name? Dave. Dave. They were uh, – Dave just passed away, you know. Yeah. Not too long ago. Great, great referees. Uh, Ronnie West was another one. Ronnie West worked in Continental, and he, he worked in uh, Mid-South. Uh, who's the guy in Charlotte? Dave, not Dave. It's not Tommy Some Young, because everyone. Tom, yeah. Tom, Tommy, Tommy Young, he was good. Uh, Jerry Calhoun in Memphis. He was a good referee. And those are the ones that come to mind because nowadays referees are forgotten, which they shouldn't be. But I've noticed, and I don't know if they're doing it now, but WWE up to several months ago didn't give the names of the referee. He was just the referee. Hmm. Do they do that now or no? I they, for they years, sh- for years, they made them just completely anonymous. But when I was watching wrestling in the late nineties, it was Tim White and Earl Hebner and Teddy Long, 
and Mike Kyoda yeah. and the blonde guy, I can't remember his name. They all had, like, and, and Tim White would do some, you know, facing yeah. up with Cornette or whoever it was, you know, or, you know, throw some punches and even did some promos. You know, they gave everybody a personality, and I don't think that's a bad thing. No, it's not. Because you may want to get to a spot where you might want to involve one of those guys. You got to use what you're, what you got. I mean, you can't bring another guy in to do something, but if you make these guys characters before they're needed, that serves a purpose later on. Mm -hmm. But if Vince didn't want them known, I don't, it's up to him. So. Okay. Next question. Dutch water sundown asks, did you ever hear what the story behind Hogan's black eye was at WrestleMania 9? He said it was a jet ski accident, but many believe that Randy Savage punched him before the event. Have you heard anything about that? Well, I know that <clears throat> he used to do a he's – from, he's from Florida. He would go out and jet ski, ski, or whatever they would do. And they would do hang gliding. Mm-hmm. Him and Brutus Beefcake. I tend to believe. And who was he? Who was he facing on, on this particular WrestleMania? Uh, this was the Las Vegas WrestleMania. It was him and Brutus versus uh, Ted DiBiase and IRS. And then at the end, Hulk Hogan impromptu challenges Yokozuna to a WWF title match, and he wins in five seconds. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was a punch by Savage, but I, I, I didn't hear anything about that. I, I would have to say that they're not that stupid. They may not have liked each other, but I, I think it was more, it, it could have been a, what did it say, hit him in the eye? Yeah, I think the story goes that Hulk Hogan, uh, uh, Hulk Hogan was hanging around with Miss Elizabeth and Elizabeth and Randy had just got divorced and I think that Randy was blaming Hogan for Liz finding somebody else, basically. I don't have an answer to that, but I think it's more like it's, uh, it, it was just an accident and Savage didn't have anything to do with it. Mm. That's what Brutus says as well. He says, Jet Ski. We'll move on. Zweller, I would like to know what Dutch's view on ending the Undertaker's streak, or stake, as they put it here, at WrestleMania 30 is, and if he thinks Undertaker should have retired with his streak intact, or if he thought Brock was the right choice to end the streak. Well, I personally like the streak because when it got uh, wherever it got to twenty eight and zero, what did it get up to? I think it was twenty twenty one and zero, and then it became twenty one and one. Okay, uh, whatever. I didn't personally like that the streak ended, but streaks are made to be broken, I guess, and they needed Brock to kind of get over. I think Brock pissed a bunch of people off when he broke it because, and they were literally, it was in Vegas, right? No, this is the same. This was uh, the Superdome slash Silverdome. One of the, one of the two. New Orleans. I was there. Yeah. I, I get it confused, which I do quite regularly on a lot of other stuff too. But people were legitimately stunned. They could not believe that Brock Lesnar broke the streak. The guys in the back couldn't believe that it broke the streak. The only ones, three that knew was probably the agent and Taker and Brock and Vince. The other agents didn't know. Everybody was really, really stunned. So if you're looking for that reaction, Vince got that reaction that day because nothing would have been accomplished by having, and he, he, he wasn't beating Brock because, you know, Taker was finishing up, but it would have Brock because Brock was going to be around. So by him having the little notch in his belt that he took away Taker's unbeaten streak added added a lot to Brock Lesnar but having him keep it intact that did 
that didn't do anybody any good. Didn't even do didn't even do Undertaker any good, really. I mean, he could go into a restaurant like a McDonald's and said, Hey, I'm 22 and 0 in the WWE. Let <laughs> me give me some free food. Hey, get out of here. Get out of here, you bum. But yeah, it was it was the right thing to do, and streaks were made to be broken. Brock broke it, so and and everything worked out. But I still go back and look at the video footage. It was a it was a kid there and he had glasses on and he was like, What the hell? They couldn't believe that. Because they had been uh, indoctrinated with the Undertaker was unbeatable at WrestleMania. Didn't beat him. So, but think of how much money he made on those 21 or 22 WrestleManias. Eight I figures? Mean, do you think? Oh, yeah, I think so. You think it's oh, 10 yeah. million plus? Oh, yeah. Easy. On 20? Mm. Oh, yeah. I, I would think. Well, let's go back. I don't know how he paid those top guys because they didn't have the huge contracts back then. But I think he was a he he was over ten million. I would think. Uh, I remember back in I remember exactly where I was where I watched this. I was in my old business. Uh, I had a shop many years ago, and I remember watching it on my phone. And even I was like, no, I couldn't believe it. And I also <laughs> remember the day before. I wasn't quite like like that, but. Um, I remember the day before, this was around the time that there's a, a, an app called Skybet. And you can, you know, you know, you place your bets on the app and that kind of thing. And they started taking WWE bets at that time. And they were offering bets of 13 to 1 on Brock beating Undertaker, which I find fascinating that they would offer odds on wrestling in the first place. But still, and then right at the end, they had to lower the odds because there were so many uh, people betting on Brock Lesnar to win. That they ended up dropping it to like ten to one or eight to one or something like that. So I wonder if somehow, I don't know, maybe just a lot of people felt that was the year, or somehow something got leaked. I don't know, but someone, someone was feeling it that that was going to be the year. Well, apparently the majority didn't feel it, and he may have had a lot of bets, but that's only amongst betting people. Most people don't bet. As for me, I, I never bet. I don't know why. I don't even know how to bet. And you can go online and bet, but I don't even know how to do that. Hmm. So, but it it was the the right guy at the right time. I think. I, I agree. And a lot of people were complaining about Brock Lesnar. He's already who else could it have been? And and Brock and Paul Heyman together have milked that like a cow. Mm-hmm for nearly 10 yep. years and got the most out of it. So I think that was definitely the right person. Uh, we will and, move on. And, oh, sorry. And now now we know why Brock rejected the match with Bray Wyatt. Because he says, now you're going to make me a cartoon figure. Mm. And that's basically what they would do. Even though he, he would, I don't know how they would do that. But it really doesn't play to Brock's strengths. It it actually lowers him to Bray's level, and that's that's where he doesn't want to go. Because I don't, I don't, I don't think Bray's. I don't think he's over like he thinks he is. We'll move on. Greg asks, while you were with the WWF during the New Generation era, who were some of the backstage agents, and can you rank the agents from best to worst? Thanks, and all the best to both of you. Well, Tony Gurria was one. He was okay, but he he didn't have any earth shattering improvements to a match. Basically when they would say, this is what we want in the match. They let the talent go off, figure it out, come back, give the agent, because when the match is going on, the agent is sitting at gorilla position, telling the truck, this is what's coming. This is what's coming. This is what's coming. What's this? What's this? And if you have something special, he's already laid that out to the producer in the truck and he's, he's related to the cameraman, but Tony was there. Briscoe was there, but you know, so many finishes that you lay out, most of them are just ABC. This, this, it's done threes, one, two, three. Okay. We got it. Let's go. Uh, The really complicated ones were left down to, 
Who? Pat Patterson. He generally did the main Pat, events, Pat, didn't he? Yeah. Pat Patterson, but only really big ones. And I think he only got them when the other ages didn't quite get it. Because, and Vince will have an idea. Vince could lay some of these out, him and Pat. But some of them were were classics. And Pat had come along in the wrestling business years before I did. Because he achieved all his notable booking success in San Francisco, in the Cow Palace. That was their main arena with Roy Shires. And he had another, he had a partner. What was his partner's name? Louis Dondero. Who? Louis. Louis Dondero. No, that, oh. No, that was his in real life partner. Oh, sorry. I thought that's what you meant. <laughs> Not Ray Stevens. Ray Stevens, sorry. And oh, and I met I met Louie too, and I used to ride with Pat all the time in in Florida, and he would tell me stories about Louie, and Louie didn't like this, and Louie didn't like that, and of course it was no big secret he was the first openly gay guy that I remember in in, in wrestling, but nobody nobody give a crap, nobody cared. It was what it was. If you like him, go do it. I mean, as long as he wasn't trying to kiss me or anything. But and and Pat is hilarious. I would ride. I rode. I don't know, twenty thousand miles with him at least. And he's funny as hell. He's entertaining. And I would pick his mind, and he would talk about San Francisco and how it was done then and what they did and. They had a lot of sellouts in San Francisco and at the Cow Palace. And and he told me all those old stories. I wish I could remember some of them, but I was all, I was wore out on the road because Florida was a lot of long trips. You don't think they'd be that long, but, and this way they would book it. Tampa was on Tuesdays and that's where everybody lived. That's where the office was. So we all lived there. Because it was central in the state. Uh, Monday was West Palm Beach, was 220 miles south. Then we'd come back to Tampa. And we'd work in Tampa. And some of us were working in Fort Myers on Tuesday, and that's like 140 miles. But, and then Wednesday we'd do TV. Then we would go to Miami, which was about 60 miles south of where we were Monday. That's like 260 miles and then come back in a car Thursday. We would go to Jacksonville, which is North, uh, Northeast, really about 230 miles, 220 miles. And then come back to Tampa Friday. We'd go to Tallahassee, which was about 240 to the Northwest. Then we'd come back to Tampa. We spent a weekend in Tampa. So this is where you went. Whoop, 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 whoop. All week, and we had a lot of miles on those cars. Who who was a uh, Pat feuding with in Florida? I don't really know anything about his Florida run. Well, I don't really remember. Dusty wasn't there. The two times I was in Florida, Dusty wasn't there. The second time I went there, Dusty had gone to to Mid Atlantic. Mm -hmm. He had gone to Charlotte. And I took his place as the as booker. Mm -hmm. The first time, I don't know where where Dusty was. I think he may have been. It may have been WWF. Yeah. Um, if it was in 77 or something like that, I think he was feuding with Superstar in New York then. Okay. He was there then. Okay. And then Superstar came to, then he would come to Florida. Florida used a lot of top names because I remember Superstar was was here, Koloff was here, big names, Dusty, Murdoch, Stan Hansen. I don't think Brody came through here or not much. And of course the Briscoe started here. Mm -hmm. And see, Florida always had the reputation of being 
like a shooter's territory, even though it wasn't. When I first went to Florida, people, other wrestlers would tell me, oh, man, they really do that real wrestling down there. I said, what do you mean? I said, oh, you know, the, if you're an amateur, and, oh, they love that. Man. So I got there, and I went to TV. I, when I went, you know, I started in a town. And hell, the wrestling looked just like what I'd left. It didn't look any different. And Tuesday night, this is before the TV on Wednesdays, well, it was still arm drags and drop kicks and hip tosses and didn't look any different. Wednesday didn't look any different. So I didn't even know what they were talking about. What they were talking about was Eddie Graham. He loved amateur wrestling. So a lot of the guys that got in, like Steve Kern was an amateur wrestler, Brian Blair, amateur wrestling. Uh, well, back when Brist- was one. Backlund was another. I, I was I broke in with him in Florida. Uh, the Briscoes. <clears throat> I didn't break in with them, but they were AA, uh, AAU national champions or champions. And uh, Bob Roop was a was an amateur. And they used to have a thing. And I haven't talked about this. I talked about it on. I, I've, I've written some stuff about it. But they call it the Snake Pit, and the Snake Pit was the ring that they kept set up in Tampa at the old office address. And I never will forget it because every one of their, uh, if you want to attend a TV taping, 106 North Albany Street. And it sat there and it was just an older building that served as the office. It's where they do their accounting. But in the back, they had a little TV studio, they called it. And with a ring sitting out there with some seats around it. So when Eddie Graham would hear or somebody would come up to him, they thought wrestling was a bunch of shit. That we were all fake. He went, oh, really? You think that? Yeah. Okay. Would you be willing to back that up? They say, yeah. So he said, okay, meet us at the office on Thursday at 1 o'clock. Can you make it? Oh, yeah, I can make it. Well, then he'd bring in usually Bob Roop. And I had a tape of this somewhere. I may still have it. But he took this guy in the ring. He beat this poor son of a bitch almost to death. I mean, not by hitting him, just by what they call stretching him. He would take his arm and the guy was saying, please, even the guy's wife, got in the ring and was begging Roop to stop. And I, I'm watching, and I said, damn, come on, Bob, break it. And I'm, I'm talking to a tape. And they have taken a lot of guys back in that little, the snake pit, they called it, or the dungeon, I called it, and just beat the living shit out of them. One guy, they beat him so bad or hurt him so bad when he rode over, he saw a door over there, and he made a beeline for the door and got outside. Of course, it's kind of – they had the lights on in there. But you could see the, the sunshine from Florida just streaming in. And he went and waved down a cop. And he and he said that he was in there wrestling, and they had hurt him. And you know what the cop said? Well, why are you in there? It's a wrestling <laughs> ring. You are – did you get into it willingly? He said, well, yeah, but they, they're trying to kill me. He said, I, I I don't know. You can go talk to the to the precinct boss, I guess, but I don't see nothing. And a guy was running down the street, and he, he was hurt. I, I thought they may have taken that a little too far. Oh, yeah, Bob Backer would be in there sometimes, too. It got brutal. They asked me to come down there one day. I said, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'll take a rain check on that. <laughs> maybe like another year, maybe. I wasn't about to get in there. But if I'd have wanted to learn to wrestle, Eddie would have set up lessons just for me to go in there. Of course, they wouldn't hurt, they wouldn't hurt me. They would try to teach me. But so and they had another guy down there called Lars Anderson, who was like an amateur. 
Mm-hmm. So one time I'm in the ring and I'm going to, I, I went to TV and they had me booked against Lars Anderson. And I noticed that when it was coming time for our match, everybody crowded in this one little room where the TV monitor was. And I thought, something ain't right here. So I says, okay. I went out. And I'm going to put Lars over. I've been in the business, what, two years, three years. I was going to put him over. Well, he he took me down. But he was awfully, awfully rough. Like he would, he chin locked me and he, he yanked my head up. But I didn't say nothing the first time. Then the second time, he, he yanked it up again. I said, hey, man, loosen up. And when I said that, loosen, loosen up, it pissed him off, and he got a little harder. Well, I got to the ropes. Now it dawned on me, okay, now I know why the guys are hanging around that monitor. They want to see. I knew one thing about amateur wrestling, and I, I just heard it on ABC Wide World Sports. It was called the Gamby Roll where all of a sudden he goes here, but you roll out of it. And I did that and surprised him. I didn't have wrestling. wrestle him. I just happened to do a move to get away from it. And I took him and leg dived him and took him down. The They said the people watching when a big chair went up. Oh my God. So I, and I got him down and I, I, I told, I told Lars, I said, Lars, take your finish or you're not going to get it. Not that I could have, he could have probably broke my neck. Well, he took his finish, and of course, it was a submission. I give up, you know, and he kind of pushed me down. He's pissed off. He's mad. Well, I go back in the dressing room, and he beats me back in there. Now, this time I'm pissed off, and I very seldom get pissed off at these guys. But he tried to hurt me is what he tried to do. I walked in there, and I told Lars, I said, and he was sitting down. And I remember Killer Carl Cox was sitting right to the to the left of him. And I Cox Killer was my friend. He didn't like Lars anyway. I said, Lars, if you get up, I'm gonna goddamn knock your effing ass out. Right? And he said, Hey man, what the, then we got an argument. And I was just waiting for him to get up. I was getting ready to punch him. Of course, he would have if they hadn't have pulled him off of me, he'd have probably beat the crap out of me. But and then I remember Jerry Briscoe coming in and taking up for me. I never have mm-hmm. forgotten this. And Jerry came in. He said, Lawrence, you fucking asshole. We're, we're sending you guys out there for you to beat to get you over. And you're going out there and you're hurting them. Why are you doing that? That's fucking stupid. And he said, you know, and he said, if you want somebody to fuck, uh, to mess with, mess with me. And he never would get up. And I, I told Jerry when I was in WWE, and it, would, it had been by the time I told him, Hell, it was a lifetime ago. I said, Jerry, you remember that? He said, oh, I, I still remember that. I said, I never thanked you for doing that, but I appreciate the support you come in there. But, hell, I'm a man, too. I mean, I was going to put him over and make him look better than what, what we had it there because what we had was just – it didn't get nobody over. It looked like a shoot, and shoots are boring. <laughs> Basically, they're boring as hell. That's why we jazzed it up and made a made a business out of it. But – and I never, I never really talked to Lars after that. Never saw him. But hell, is he still alive? I think he, yeah, he is. I think he is. Yeah. I heard last time I heard it, he was in Hawaii. He lives in Hawaii or somewhere. Oh, um, but anyway, after you. Uh, well, I'll tell you what. I'll I'll find out for you, and then uh, right. uh, at some point. But well, for we'll now... find out so I can track his ass down. Okay, I'll find out. One sec. Right, next one is John. Hi, James. Could you please ask Dutch about the time Terry Funk, this is very, very specific, this, did the Quantum Leap episode. Was there an upturn in business on the back of that? Cheers. I have no idea what he's talking about. (laughs) I didn't think you would. Uh, Quantum Leap was a show with Scott Bakula. I've actually seen that episode. Uh, I won't bore you with the details of it. Uh, But because he brought up Terry Funk, uh, how's Terry Funk's health at the moment? Do you know? Well, I heard he wasn't. <clears throat> I heard he was not as well as he was before. I think he has a little bit of dementia now. But I'm just hearing reports secondhand, thirdhand, so I I don't really know how he is. I think he still lives in Texas. Dory lives in Ocala, Florida. Has a wrestling school there. 
but I haven't seen him in years either. Mm. So those guys, I, I, I work with them in, in Puerto Rico, you know, those guys are deceiving. They don't look as big as they really are. I remember we had a match. We going to go Broadway, which means time limit draw. And we had a big show that week. We was on one of another. We was on, I think, Ponce, Puerto Rico, which is about an hour and a half from San Juan. And I remember right at the end of the match, he said, close line me. And I shot him in. I don't know what happened, but I hit him right in the like right in the chin. And then he went down and he hit his head. And it knocked him out. Oh, and he told me the next day, he said, Wow, man, you <laughs> you really laid that clothesline in. <laughs> and I said, Oh, I'm sorry, Terry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sir. <laughs> but they but he had he had some great stories. Dory wasn't the talker. Terry was the talker. And if you didn't know that they were related, you couldn't tell they were brothers at all. But but they were solid. I had a match with – when I took the book over in Florida, I was talking about a little earlier, I replaced Dory in Florida. So for him – to kind of give me a a head start of getting over a little bit. Terry did the honors for me. He he put me over everywhere. But Dory was very, very physical. You wouldn't think by watching him that he is, but he weighed about 240, maybe a little more. And he would do those, the British got them lifters. You know, he would, they, it's like an, a, a, an uppercut, but yeah. they catch you with this part of their arm. My God. And I remember the last month before Terry, I mean, before Dory was leaving, I had him like every night. And he would hit me with about six or eight lifters every match. I mean, they were really, they would jar you. They wouldn't knock your breath out. But I mean, I mean, it was like, ow. And he and he'd make full contact. And it would it would rattle you. So so the first night I worked with him, I knew I had still 20 more matches at least to go with him. So I sat down one night and I says, 20 matches at six. <laughs> An average of six lifters a night, hundred <laughs> and twenty and hundred and twenty lifters to go. Uh, not that I couldn't take them, but you knew you was in a match. I mean, if you know you can say what you want to about wrestling, but it is a physical, physical endeavor. And you take some of those guys, and even you think it's hard and solid, they're still working with you. And you think, what if he really wanted to lay that thing in? He knocked me into next week. So, but but Dory taught me a lot about the wrestling business. Terry did too. And Terry was great to make trips with because he would tell these stories. I can't tell this story on him. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you later. I wish I could tell everybody, <laughs> but I but I can't. Uh but he 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 would tell the damnedest stories, and he would laugh the biggest. And of course, they were funny. I mean, even if it wasn't funny, the way Terry told the story, oh, it was great. And and Terry, who who thought Terry was like the the greatest in the world was Eddie Gilbert. And we'll talk about him probably in some upcoming up episodes. But Eddie Gilbert, Eddie Gilbert patted himself off two guys. Jerry Lawler and Terry Funk. So I'm watching him one one, one night in a spot show, and I'm sitting back there. And the first, like, it was going to go about 20 minutes. So the first 10 minutes, he was Lawler. You could tell. You know, he's doing all the Lawler stuff. 
And then after the middle of the match, all of a sudden I see him almost switch character, switch personality, and then he become Terry Funk for the rest of the match. He had two heroes, Terry Funk and, and Jerry Lawler. So quite quite a quite a sight to see. <laughs> uh, you got a brother, I've got a brother. Uh what was it with Terry and Dory? Because they seemed to be like happy together at some points, but was it just like general brotherly rivalry at times where they'd fall out, or what was it? Like I'm saying, you wouldn't even think they were brothers. Hmm. They were just so, and they were so much different than each other. Terry was bullshit all the time. <laughs> Dory wasn't like that. Dory was more reserved, <clears throat> more serious. And if you was like, if, if you met them, say you didn't know they were brothers, you'd never, you never put it together. Someone told me that I think Dory's nickname at one point was like Liquid Valium or something like that because he was just so smooth in the ring. And maybe it was Dr. Tommy used to say that. I can't remember. Well, he was smooth, but he was solid, believe me, and never got in a hurry. That's what you, that's what you would understand later when these guys got to to be a champion, they never got in a hurry. And one thing they never got in a hurry was because that's what got them there. They took their time, worked it for maximum impact, whatever they did, and, and it worked. I think I was in Florida when Terry Funk won the title from Briscoe. Check that. Okay. If you can tell that. And Thanks. the reason I, I'm saying I don't know is because I had left early. I think it was in Miami. I will find out one sec. Okay, so I've had a look. And Terry Funk beat Jack Briscoe December 10th, 1975, Miami Beach, Florida. You know, I was there. Didn't know it. <laughs> nobody told nobody told me nobody cleared it with me but i had gone down with you know some other guys and by the time i was i was probably on second or third that night and the guys i went with were like on fourth or around me so we'd all get through early and and it was a championship match and i don't even think i heard anything about it the next day. I think I heard about it like a, like a fan. I, I think I heard about it on TV. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what? They, they swapped the title. They changed the title in, in Miami because, and I was, if I'd have known that I would have actually stayed to watch the match. Mm -hmm. But yeah. like I said, I've, I've said it here. It was a long way to Miami. And then you have to go all the way across alligator alley through the Everglades I hope I used to I used to pray that my car never broke down in the Everglades. <laughs> Cause you only got like thousands of gators around you. And if they smell you, they'll come looking for it. You'd have to get on top of the car and they can climb cars too. So And you drive at night? Oh man, it was brutal. Yeah. Brutal. We will move on. Nick, I don't know if you heard of it or knew about it, but if you did, what was your opinion on Gorgeous Ladies of Wrestling? I know there were 10 episodes of Glow on Netflix a long time ago. So, Glow, I um, uh, so we don't retell that story. I know you were on Family Feud against some of the Glow girls, but uh, what do you think of the Glow show itself? I didn't see the, the last Glow. I didn't see it. Was David Lane still with them? Uh, the David glow. David yeah. McLean is that the one? No, David no. This is the um, the first glow from eighty six to ninety, whatever. Oh, it was. what did I think about it? I loved glow. Did you? I, I I loved it. The work was the work was the shits, but still, I was intrigued by it. So I would watch it, and they had great names, and. I mean, I, I watched it every time that I could, that I become, I mean, if I ever crossed a glow show, I would stay and watch it. It was almost like a variety show, wasn't it? With sketches and stuff. 
Yeah, and David David McLean was in a lot of them. I remember one time he went out and he was going to feed everybody because they didn't have catering. <laughs> he just brought in a bunch of McDonald's, a bunch of bags, <laughs> <laughs> and he threw it at the girls. All right, here's your food. And <laughs> it was it was actually, I think David McLean made that up as he went along. Mm. That that's what I think. Maybe some of the best and, bookers did. Let me tell you, I've got some names for you here: Babe, the farmer's daughter; Amy, the farmer's daughter; Corporal yep. Kelly, Dallas, uh, Hollywood. I know Ivory was in it at some point. Matilda the Horn, Mount yep. Mount Fu- Fiji, uh, Pepper, yep. Roxy Astor. I don't remember that one. Uh, Tina Ferrari. That was Ivory. There you go. Mm-hmm. Well, it was a good show, and. I think it made two years, or did it? I think it made more. I think it made about four. I've got a pen in my mouth. Okay. And, but it was good. And the reason that I was interested, and I should have watched the remake of Glow, was because uh, my friend, Awesome Kong, Mm -hmm. she, she she was in the remake of Glow. Yeah. And she was great. It was a good series. Uh, what what's the Mark <laughs> Mark Moran, is he called? He's the trainer, you know, the big mustache guy. He was great in it. Uh huh. So I forgot who first alerted me to Awesome Kong. I think she was called Amazing Kong first. Then we changed her name, or Jeff Jarrett changed her name to Awesome, which I I was fine with that. I saw a match between her. And some Japanese girl, if I heard the name, I'd remember it. Takahashi? If you didn't know... Takahashi? Maybe not. It was another mm. name. No, okay. But they had a match that if you didn't know it was a work, they would have, even if you had known it was a work, it looked like a shoot. Because in Japan, you take your time, but your strikes are brutal. And so they were literally, I would say, 80% shooting with their strikes. I mean, you can shoot with a strike. You just don't got to hit them in the nose and mouth. I mean, you can lay it in. And that's what alerted me to to, to Awesome Kong. And Gail Kim gave me a, gave me a tape because I guess this was before the days you could go on the Internet and look it up. It was. But and also Kong and and I've told her she was the reason that the TNA knockouts got over. I remember when I wanted to book them, nobody wanted, nobody agreed with me. Vince Russo did not agree with me. He could give a crap less about it, which I thought weird because I thought he'd have all kind of ideas for the girls. Jeff, he didn't much want it. And he asked me one day, he said, do you think there's enough, we can find enough girls to fill it? Because me being a smart ass, I said, well, let me see. He's like 300 million people in America and half of them are women. It's 150 million. And I think in the age which we're looking for, uh, that's probably 10, 15, 20 million girls, maybe. And he looked at me and said, I got it. I got it. So, So we got them. And I told everybody, I don't want anybody coming up with anything about these girls. That's I'll, I'll handle the girls, period, by myself. And it's actually me and Scott Demore that did it. And uh, I would tell Scott what I needed, and he'd go and give it to the girls. And and I remember the first time I called the girls together, I said, girls, you're going to get your chance. This was before WWE concentrated on females. Mm. This is when they were still doing bra and panty matches and doing that silly stuff with them. And I told them, I had a meeting, and I said, you're no longer bitches and whores and sluts. And I said, you're athletes. And I want you to go out there tonight and every night we put you in a match, and I want you to outshow these guys. Oh, they love that. And those girls all work together to prove that the that the girls they were they they should be there and they did. Gail Kong, or Gail Kong, Gail Kim mm-hmm. and Awesome Kong drew the highest rating I think ever 
on a TNA show, and it was a three point, it was a three four four something like that, three point whatever. But they outdrew Hogan, so we we put Gail Kim and Kong in the main event on TV, and they drew a hell of a rating. And every week, the girls would always outperform everybody else. They would outperform Sting. They would outperform whoever we had, uh, AJ, Samoa Joe. It was the girls, and we we would try to have two matches a show, and we got them over. What do you think? And then act, after they got over, everybody comes and said, Dutch, wait a minute. I got this idea about the girls. Huh, whoop, don't want to hear it. I do not <laughs> want to hear it because nobody wanted them here, so I don't want to hear it. Then I'd say, all right, what is it? <laughs> There's a couple of things I saw bring up. One, in an interview you gave many years ago, I remember you saying, like, when you when you cast Awesome Kong, I know it's the wrong word, but cast Awesome Kong and put him on the TV. Yep. It's like, you're going to be flipping that channel, and then you're going to look at it, and you're going to see Awesome Kong, and that is a channel change, a stopper of a, yep. of a woman. But also, uh, I want to ask you this, and I don't know if you know the answer or not, is she goes to WWE afterwards, after in 2010 or whatever. Why did that just not work out? I know she was pregnant at one point, I think, and she couldn't wrestle, but apart from that... Okay, she was over in TNA. Mm -hmm. And you mean she leaves TNA, the same girl, and she goes to WWE. You know what that tells me? They didn't know how to book her. If they'd have took her out there in the same mode that I had her in in TNA, they'd have drew big money. And take your time with her. She would be the girl's equivalent of a Roman Reigns during that period. Because if she just went out and beat these girls up, and I told her, I said, I don't want you going off your feet till I tell you to. And, you know, they had figured this one match, she would go down, and I said, well, who told you to go down? Oh, well, some agent had told them to go down. I said, no, listen to me. Do Don't go down. If they tell you to go down, come and see me. Because I, 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 I actually envisioned her as the female version of Abdullah the Butcher. <laughs> and I actually, I put a Muslim girl with her. Yeah. She wasn't really a Muslim girl. I called her Raisha Saeed. That, that was, wore the whole deal. That was cheerleader Melissa, wasn't it? I think. Cheerleader Melissa. And I just put her out there. Never did a lot with her because that was still a really touchy subject. And I thought I would receive a brushback when I put her out there, but not a word, not a word. And I didn't do anything to insult Islam because, you know, you, you can't do that. And I said, just go out there and just stand there. And all I want them to see you from you is your eyes. And they did it right. See, if you follow directions, and they follow what you tell them to do. And the truck, I told the truck, I said, I want you guys to catch her eyes. That's really the only thing. You can't even tell if she was heavy or skinny. You couldn't tell. But the eyes, I mean, they say that's the mirror into the soul. And I mean, I'm not trying to get philosophical here, but but that was the only thing you could see of her. But she had that air of mystery around her and I never really got to the to the part where how did how did awesome Khan meet uh, Raisha Saeed we never got to that part and that was a whole new book I had going we could have went through that but as they say see, plans patience change. patience patience Right, uh, I'm going to very quickly ask this one, and I'm actually going to answer it for you because we talked about it beforehand. Um, I haven't even got a name for it, but this person asks about the All Japan Tour where you team with Billy Robinson against Jumbo Saruta and Giant Baba, and you said you don't remember it. So at yeah. some point, maybe we can watch that as a watch-along. So I think we've got maybe a couple more in us, uh, depending on how quick the answers are or not. Eddie G., can you take us back to the WWF in 1996 after Kevin Nash and Scott Hall had left the company and headed to WCW? Shortly afterward, WWF started promoting the return of Diesel and Razor Ramon. 
Then former big titan Rick Bogner and some no-hoper called Glenn Jacobs turned up as <laughs> gimmick doppelgangers. What the heck happened? Not much. That was a no-happening era in the WWF. See, with Glenn, they tried him a couple of deals. They did the dentist first, which was the shits. I mean, there was no, there was no, he was a dentist member. Here's mm. a good one. There was no teeth in, <laughs> in the character. That's pretty good, huh? Mm. There was nothing to chomp into. Then they took him and made him this diesel character, which still there was, there was no gas in that tank, buddy. Mm. That's, a, that's another good <laughs> And then they made him Cain, but, and if anybody hasn't figured this out yet, with Cain came what? A story. A story built in with Undertaker. That's all wrestling is, is stories and relevance. Because now, by him being associated, according to him, by genetics, that's a built-in angle with Undertaker. Built in. That's where it's going. Everybody can see it's going. And I think Kane, didn't he have Paul Barra as a manager during that part? He did, yeah. Oh, yes. He did. <laughs> uh, so, and I love Glenn. I, I met him. When I first met Glenn, and I, I tell the story on my website. If you want to go to it, I'm, I'm still getting it up and running. But there's still, you can read the stories. It's uh, where I first met Kane. I met him on some independent show in southern Indiana, I think, maybe. Or maybe Illinois. And I'd never seen him before. I mean, and he come in, came over, and he knew who I was. And he introduced himself, which you know I was appreciative of. And I asked him where he was from. He kind of told me, and he wanted to get into, he was trying to get into wrestling. And and he was, and I, I, I worked with him that night. And what amazed me about him was he was, he was so light for such a big guy. And take her too. Both of them for such big guys. They were, they were like, they were princes, not princess, but princes. I mean, they were like silk. And, but, and I told him, where did he learn? And he was trying to tell me someplace. And I was going to Puerto Rico and I said, listen, if you're interested in coming down here, I could use you. And I was working for Carlos just before I quit, but, but and then he called and I said, well, I want you to start in uh, such and such a date. Okay. And then he called me about a week later and he was, I could tell he was nervous. He said, I said, are you okay? He said, well, you know, I've been hearing some stories about Puerto Rico and I went, and I knew what stories he was hearing is that they don't pay anybody down there. And I told him, I said, don't worry. Listen, I'll get you X number of dollars per week. And I told Carlos, he's got to make this. And Carlos honored it the whole time. He did. And somebody asked me, he said, well, what if Carlos hadn't honored that? I said, well, I would have made it up the week that he missed, and then he would have left. But the whole time he was there, he made what I told him he would make. But his biggest uh, achievement there was working a set schedule and wrestling full time. We'd go to the town. He'd do this, come out of the ring. I would critique him the next night. Same deal. I'd ride with him, critique him, critique him. And sometimes it's little things. And I was telling him, you're too big to take this bump. 
don't do this, and don't do that, but never in a tone to where it's demeaning. It's, it's in teacher mode. It's what it is. And then I would ask him, you know, if you got any questions, ask me because this is where you're going to learn. And then I, I think he left. He went to Smoky Mountain for a little bit. And then from then on, uh, he went to he went to WWE or WWL. When, when you were with him in the WWF, so I, I know I would get so I think Undertaker uh, had one match with him in Smoky Mountain. Then he recommended him to Vince to bring him up. And then he becomes the dentist. And then he becomes the fake Diesel after a year. And obviously, you know, I'm presuming you're going to be speaking to Glenn quite a lot in the locker room at this time when he's got this awful character of the dentist. And he was feuding with Jerry Lawler as well, who's also your friend. What was what was Glenn talking about when, when he had to portray a dentist every day? I mean, is he the kind of person to complain about it or just be happy he's what, on TV? What year was this? 95. Eh. I was with... 95 was, oh, yeah, that was my... You were the Harris not, brothers then. I was the Harris brothers. Then they left. And then since I had nobody to manage, they was they were sitting me at home toward the end of the year. And I, I think his dentist run was was basically over by the time I got back in there. Hmm. Then when I got back in there, I was uh, with... Uh, Justin Hawk Bradshaw, JBL, John Layfield. And I think he was becoming. What other part did he play? The diesel? Yeah. He played the diesel and he wasn't too high on it because he could tell, you can tell when it's getting over or not. And it wasn't getting over because. It was a shot at the guys who had left and the people were rejecting that. And uh, there was only one diesel and there's only one, you know, Scott Hall and trying to reproduce them in any form. The people, they, they just didn't buy it. So he wasn't too happy. I th we've got time for one more question or maybe two. It depends how you're feeling. Um, would you rather talk about Continental Championship Wrestling and the sale of such, or would you rather talk about uh, Roxy? Or we can talk about both if you like. Let's talk about Roxy a minute. Okay then, Andrew Elder. Hi, Dutch and James. Long-time fan from Memphis and your days here. In TNA at Sacrifice 2008, the makeover battle royal. The stories that the finish was going to be that no one was going to get their head shaved. Wonky finish. But Roxy volunteered to do it. Was it true that she did volunteer? Now, this is Roxy Laveau, isn't it? Also, the fans not knowing who booked it and loving Roxy started chanting, Fire Russo. Whose idea was this? And also, is it true that Dixie said the next segment that she heard a Fire Russo chant, she was going to fire the person in charge of the match that she heard that chant? You know, Dixie, she defies belief sometimes. People say they were reading the sheets. Of course, Meltzer, he hated Russo more than he hated me. And he would blast everything he did. Of course, we were blasting a lot of Russo stuff too. But, <laughs> but she was going to fire the person that was in charge of the match. And it wasn't even their idea. It was Russo's idea or creative's idea. <laughs> Dixie was going to fire them. And I've heard that on more than one occasion. I got blamed for uh, a fire Russo chant. They said it was my idea. It wasn't my idea. I think you asked me about it, about the Stairway yeah, to Heaven match. Yeah, it was that coffin thing that went up to the yeah, sky, wasn't it? Yeah. That wasn't my – I don't even know where that came from. But – but they started it, and they started it down in uh, the studio in Orlando at uh, Universal. Fire Russo. <laughs> Fire Russo. <laughs> but, but we're, we're talking about Roxy Laveau. We are. So the head shaving, did she volunteer? Yeah, I, I think she did. I don't, I don't know. What were the stipulations on the match? The loser? 
was going to get their head shaved. I think so. The makeover battle royal, the finish was going to be that no one was going to get their head shaved, supposedly. But then Roxy actually volunteered to do it. Well, she did it. And, uh, but the thing I remember the most about Roxy was she was tough as nails. So we had a girl there named Raka Khan. That was her name, Raka Khan. And I gave her the name for some reason. I thought she looked like a Raka Khan. And she was with Steiner. He was wearing that crazy Roman headdress deal. And Raka Khan looked like a, seemed like an app name for her. And I think people would remember the name Raka Khan. And I remember the legal counsel, <laughs> TNA, called me up one day. Oh, man, I don't know where they found this guy. But he had a southern accent as it worse than mine. He went, well, Dutch, you know that Rock of Con girls, you know, there's another person with that name. You know that, right? And I went, well, yeah, I know it. Well, we can't do that. I said, can't do what? Well, we can't have the same name this other person's got. I said, well, have they complained about it? Well, no. I said, well, we don't have a problem then. If they haven't complained, what's the problem? He said, but what if they do? I said, I don't know. I guess we'll deal with it when they do that. Of course, they never complain. I don't think they give a crap. But anyway, this Roxy girl and this Raka Khan, and Raka Khan was about 6'2". She was a big girl. And Raka wanted to do some stuff with her, but this Raka Khan girl didn't want to do it because apparently she had a friend in the back that was pretty well up in the company politically. And he advised her not to do those spots with this Roxy girl. But Raka Khan didn't tell the Roxy girl that she was advised, but she said she just didn't want to do them. Well, I was watching the match and Roxy said, if she don't do it, she said, I'm telling you right now, I'm going I'm to beat the crap out of her. I said, oh, don't do that. No, I'm, I'm just telling you. Went out there and Rock, Rock a Con put the, the the stop sign. I'm not doing that. Well, the next thing I know, that Roxy girl went off on her and knocked her down, stopped on her in the head a couple of times hard. And then Rock a Con was a little more cooperative. <laughs> then she did the stuff, but, uh, but I, and I told rock, I said, rock, you got to learn about politics. You can't just tell somebody you're just not going to do it, but you want them to do stuff for you. I know you're a big girl, but you got to have an agreement before you go out there. But if you, if you stop somebody else's, uh, what they want to do, then they have a right to basically stop yours. Now I said, Usually that stuff is cleared up in the dressing room, but and rock and the, and the girl uh, Roxy, Roxy Laveau, mm -hmm. from the from the song, she didn't get any trouble for it. She told me what was going on. I said, "Well, hope you don't do it, but we'll deal with it afterwards." <laughs> this, you know, that's not like in the knockouts vision. That's not the first time I've heard someone shoot or semi shoot on someone because I interviewed Shelly Martinez uh, a while back. And she said that she was in a match with uh, Jackie, uh, I was going to say Jackie Wilson, uh, yeah. Jacqueline Moore, sorry, I can't remember her surname. Yeah. And she didn't know why, but she found herself in like a really uh, legitimate gu guillotine, I think, at one point, and Jackie just stopped working with her. Do you remember that at all and why that happened? I, I, but but I do remember ja Jacqueline, Jacqueline yeah. was tougher than nails too. And I could have told that, what's her name, Martinez? Shelly, yeah. Shelly Martinez. Don't piss her off. Because she's from Memphis, and I knew her. And she's she's she will literally fist fight you. She'll fist fight a guy. And she had a lot of guts. Nobody messed with her. And if nobody's smart and 
Shelly Martinez up, I don't think they need to now. But but I hate stuff like that to happen. But some of those girls, you never hear how tough they are. They were some tough girls out there. Really, really tough girls. The worst match I have ever seen. I, I, have I told you this? Is it Jenna Maraska? Yes, yes. Jenna Maraska. And have, have you found that tape? Yeah, I know where it is. I've been threatening to show you that for so long. And we've, oh, we and we've just not see, done it. We, we got to see that. But it's, but it's coming, folks. It's do you want, coming. Do you want to close out the podcast with it? I can find it very quickly. I've got it saved. Well, if you want to. Okay, I'll pause one then, minute. Oh, go on. No, this has to go down as the worst televised match in pro wrestling history. The only one that comes close to it, I don't think is available now, and it's any George Goulas ma- <laughs> <laughs> match from Nashville. <laughs> but this one here was, is... I was actually thanking Booker T's wife for just getting through the match. It was horrible. So I, I, I put my stamp on it. I want you to see it now. Okay, bear with me one second. All right, Dutch, we're back. And let's just rewind at time. I need to put the volume down as well. You are torn because of- Jenna Maraska. That's her on the way to the ring. Look at that outfit. So, so this was the girl from Survivor. She's wearing the she's wearing shoes that she got. She's basically doing like the ludicrous stripper routine. Oh my god! <laughs> oh my god! Well, <laughs> Darmel, what what a look! Sorry, video watchers. I've uh, had to overlay a bit of a logo on this because even though we are reviewing it and we are uh, legally entitled to use this footage, there is automatic content ID to be aware of that they might try and take it down. So, Well, this match with the infamous... When was the last time you watched this? When was the last time you watched it? Oh, I don't know. I think I watched it. I don't know, three, four years ago. <laughs> and Charmel, I felt sorry for Charmel. She's not a worker either. No, but she still is better than Jenna Maraska. Now, neither one of them are wrestlers. Let me say, let me say that. They're not trained. And, and not, not very good strippers either. Uh, she would foul bankruptcy if she went to a strip joint. <laughs> I mean, they would... I, li- I like the I, I like the footwear, but this is. Do you, do you know, Dutch? I've is, never seen this all the way through. You, you've never seen it. I've never seen this. Well, this won't make you a believer. <laughs> so she. Oh, <laughs> uh, if you've never seen this, ladies and gentlemen, this just has been known as the worst possible wrestling match Mm. of all time. Right, uh, you'll have to give us some more play-by-play. They were doing the camera thing like in WWE where they go and I don't know where that come from either. I actually, I I made a request stop it. You give if people have, you know, you could give them a headache doing it. Oh, this is the six sides six sided ring which was horrible for guys to get used to. Instead of going at 90 degree angles, you're going at, I don't know, you're going at 65% (laughs) angles. And it's hard to work. Did you see these two trying to practice this thing out? Uh, I tried to avoid it because this wasn't my match. But they did at least attempt to practice it, did they? Oh, yeah, they, they tried, but they just... Let me put my stamp of disapproval on this. <laughs> I, I never approved this match. I knew what it would be. I think we put it out there with <clears throat> with Kong. I don't know what Morosco had to do with Kong. Or Oh, man. Did you see oh, that, look at that body? See, boy, that Earl's, he's counting. He's trying to count and get it over with. Thank you, Earl. I want to point out that when um, Charmel threw Jenner into the ropes, the ropes didn't move. And then when she bounced back off, 
she actually did it in like a crescent moon shape instead of just like straight back and forth. Oh. I mean, I, I sat and watched this and I hid from the fans so they couldn't see me. Because you can look at the look at their faces. They're going. The only thing that's probably intriguing them now is that's mostly a male crowd. Males will watch anything with half clad females in it. But so they're just there's nothing to yell about. There's nothing to cheer about. So I don't know. <laughs> what the hell was that? And I'm gonna tell you short Sure, male not to have any any training isn't that bad. But she just didn't want to. She didn't want to wrestle. I don't blame her. He was sort of strong armed her into wrestling them. Is this a Russo thing? Because because he he loves making women who aren't wrestlers wrestle. Well, this uh, again. I'm gonna put my stamp of disapproval on this. I mean, it wouldn't have been so bad if it was halfway decent. It's not even that. To me, I think you disrespect your own fans by by show and and I, I guess this was on a pay per view. I guess. Oh yeah, they were charging people money for this. Current cold hard currency they were charging. Well, they weren't charging. Well, I guess I, I guess the pay per view was like. $30 or $40? Whoa, hang on, hang on, hang on. We've got to watch those slaps again. Uh, let's watch it. Watch this. Not, not from Charmel. It was, it was Jenna's. Well, here we go. <laughs> okay, fans, son. Uh, now you can kind of get the point. Oh, she's mad now. Oh, oh we're my nearly God. at the finish as well. Should we? Let's just skip to the finish. What was that? Wow! I look at no look idea. at this mounted. Ah, oh, that's atrocious. And it's also, not that good. Sharmel's like a plucked good. chicken, like like blue feathers everywhere. Uh, let's skip to the uh, let's skip to the uh, the very very lewd pin. Oh look! Oh. I mean, even Earl's just staring at it going, oh, there you go. Well, folks, there you had it. The worst match. I, well, I have a few matches about as bad as this, but not me personally, but I, I've, <laughs> I've seen them. But but we can't blame Charmel for that. You can only work with something that's working with you and – Mr. Jenna Morosco wasn't working, but again, it's not her fault too. The fault lies in the people who booked this. But Jill Dutch, you were there. You booked her. I, I did, no. <laughs> but I did. I didn't book that match. I bet somebody saying, "Damn, that Dutch don't take credit for shit. You don't take <laughs> credit for nothing." Mm. But if you know intentionally, uh, or if you know beforehand that the match is going to be a, an abomination, why would you book it? Yeah. So, and I told him, I said, I, I think I have, I said, unless this is heavily produced and shortened down to about, with entrances and everything else, to be about four to five minutes, you may get by with it. Mm. Asking them to go nine minutes or how, how long they went was is beyond their scope. And they uh, couldn't do it. So, uh, and next week it is. Next week we'll be uh, watching the best of Johnny Fairplay. I think. Oh my God! <laughs> he was a he was he was a trip. <laughs> we'll save him for next week. We'll save him for next week. Hey, but for and, ne wait a minute, and but she was Survivor, and Johnny Fairplay was too. So someone was a big was fan of Survivor then. I guess somewhere. And it could have been on, it could have been on that station too. I'm gonna have to... What station were we on? Uh, Spike, wasn't it? Spike. Spike TV. Was Survivor on that? I don't know. I can Google Check it for it. you. 
check it out and we'll, we'll tell them next week. Yeah, we'll tell you next week. But anyway, we probably won't tell you next week. We will have forgotten by then, I assure you. But for now, thank you very much for watching. What a way to end a podcast with a, a live... Just... I mean, I was looking at your face. It's just like, just it just, just kept falling throughout the match. Oh, oh, there oh. It is. brilliant! I'm glad I watched and it. This was fire, Russo. <laughs> fire! <laughs> oh my god! And I would hide from the people. Case Abe would look back there and say, "Ah, oh, Dutch, did you have something to do with this?" And I was back there like this, like, "No, no I'm not me." <laughs> I mean, but. But we got through it. Nobody died. And wrestling survived. So that's what I say. Can you kill wrestling? Can you? No, you can. You can wound you it. Can, uh, yeah, you can wound <laughs> it. And you can dis, dis- disinterest people. But kill it. Fans, we've been trying for 60 or 70 years to kill it. And can't do it. All of a sudden, somebody come up with this idea. Oh, it that pops into the imagination and look at WWE now with the, uh, the bloodline it's intrigued people and they want to see how it ends. Mm -hmm. But the key to this is don't let it end. You can kind of tip it off a little bit and then come back with it. That's what they said about Bray Wyatt though. That's never ending. But before, before we get on Bray Wyatt for any, any longer, I must shut the, shut this podcast down because, uh, uh, I've got dinner downstairs. Right, so thank you very much for watching, everybody. We will catch you again next week in Dutch. We the people. We the people. <laughs>